Got to be Westlanders, welcome back to the Lost Holotapes channel, where we explore the historical lore of Fallout using the dynamic map. Today we'll explore another creation of Nevada Band Studio, the game Fallout Sonora, the story of which is centered around post-war state of Arizona, five years after the fall of the Master. The game itself has a much more restrained narrative style. Comparing to Fallout of Nevada, this time I truly felt the gravity of the events and became invested in the main questline. I was impressed by how the developers managed to interweave the relationships between individual factions and settlements. To some extent, everyone living in the region was affected by what was happening and the destruction of certain connections between entities was bringing massive repercussions. The geopolitics in Fallout, where you can sense the truth and motivation of each faction, is damn cool, and I believe only Fallout 4 accomplished something similar. The events in the Sonoro region, named after the wasteland in the pre-war state of Arizona, are linked to the expansion of the Brotherhood of Steel and their subjugation of the local population in the year 2167. We will also explore events described in the Dayglow expansion, even though geographically San Diego is located in the New California wasteland and its history should be associated with the episode dedicated to Fallout 2. If you enjoy the series, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment. That will help a lot in the channel growth. Alright, hop on the vertebrate and don't forget your sunscreen. We are flying to Arizona. As always, let's begin with an overview of the region's geography. According to the game map, the Sonora Wasteland is truly vast. It stretches in a square shape, encompassing half of the Sonora state in Mexico and a significant portion of the Baja California Peninsula, while in the USA it occupies the lion's share of Arizona. Sonora is the first wasteland to occupy the territory of another country, besides the USA. To adhere to some sort of natural geographical boundaries, the wasteland is bounded to the north by the Grand Canyon, bordering the Utah wasteland, and to the west by the Colorado River, separating it from the Mojave and New California. At the moment, the wasteland cannot be fully divided into distinct subregions, but we can identify the following. Baja California, located on the territory of the eponymous peninsula. Sonora Desert, occupying the southern part of the wasteland and serving as a natural divider from the Mexican wastelands. Cavasso is the area around the eponymous lake on the border of the wastelands. The lore associated with this place was introduced in the narrative mode Havasu Blues of Fallout New Vegas, so we will delve into it in a separate episode. Sierra Madre, an isolated section of the territory bordering the Grand Canyon, housed in a pre-war resort complex of the same name, surrounded by toxic gas. The exact location of Sierra Madre is unknown, but let's say it's somewhere around here. I don't think old pal Elijah dragged the courier across the entire wasteland. Let's start the exploration of the lore with the Valtec Vaults. In Sonora there are plenty of them. Vault 20 is located in Tucson. As part of the experiment, the influence of a certain virus called trans 9 thc was researched, which infected the air, food and water. Vault 25 is situated within the city limits of Phoenix, Arizona, in its northern part. Its design capacity is 450 people. The vault was intended to remain active for 15 years, after which it was expected to open. Vault 26 is located west of Phoenix. Vault 27 is located north of Phoenix. As part of the experiment, according to the Fallout Bible, the vault was populated with 2,000 people, twice the intended capacity. The vault deliberately had a Mexican population, which caused racial tensions in the overcrowded shelter. However, despite the belief that the strong overcrowding was due to the Mexicans, their percentage was actually only 15%. Vault 42, located in Glendale, Arizona, had no light bulbs, with the voltage exceeding 40. Vault 43 in Mesa, Arizona, was settled with 20 men, 10 women and 1 panther as part of the experiment. The purpose of the experiment remains somewhat obscure, to say the least. Vault 45, situated in Surprise, Arizona, had its floors constantly coated with a lubricant that prevented the residents from walking normally, causing them to only slide if they managed to push off from something. Vault 47 in Sojuarita, Arizona, had its residents raised under a Boy Scout training program. Consequently, the adult inhabitants of the vault were disciplined and possessed all the necessary knowledge and skills for surviving in the wasteland. It was perhaps one of the best vaults one could end up in. However, the Boy Scouts needed to continually earn merit badges for their achievements, and those who didn't receive them were expelled. Vault 48, located in Sierra Vista, Arizona, was programmed to open just 48 hours after the start of the war. Now, let's talk about shelters, the places where people took cover during the war but were not Valtec vaults. Let's start with Sierra Madre. It was a pre-war casino complex that was supposed to become self-sufficient in the event of war. However, it also served as a testing ground for experiments conducted by the Big Mountain Research Facility, located in the Mojave. One of the facility's developments was a reddish toxic cloud that was pumped into the complex ventilation system. The 
facility also developed innovative hazmat suits, specifically designed to counteract this very cloud. One time before the war there was a gas leak and it poisoned several people. When the staff of the facility investigated the leak, they discovered that the hazmat suits reacted with the gas, causing corrosion in their locks, trapping people inside without protecting them from the toxin. Nevertheless, the complex managed to weather the war, albeit the concerning state of the ventilation system, even though the grand opening technically never happened. In the basement of Bates Motel, the Peacock family survives the Great War. In the city of Tucson, one of the Zach's supercomputers, located deep within the Davis Mountain military base, managed to defend the base from bomb drops by operating the defense systems, thereby saving the military personnel in hangars and bunkers. Now, let's delve into the chronology of Sonora from 2077 to 2167 which covers the events leading up to the end of the Fallout Sonora game. It's a pity that this time the developers provided less exposition on the pre-war cities that either survived or didn't survive the nuclear war. I really enjoyed that part of the lore in Nevada. We'll also touch upon the known history of Mexico. The pre-war city of Mexicali suffered a brutal nuclear strike, turning the few surviving residents into ghouls. While 25 closed prematurely before the evacuation was completed, only 12% of the projected capacity made it inside, which was just over 50 people. Vault 26 was destroyed by a direct nuclear strike. This was the first instance of a vault tech vault being the target of bombardment. On October 25th, Vault 48 opens and hypothetically perishes. Vault 43 also perished, not lasting even a year. Mexico City survived the war, although staying there became too dangerous as raider gangs started to form. Not that it differs from modern Mexico, but it's terrifying to think about what these raiders were capable of, especially considering that real-life Mexican cartels are still considered part of a somewhat civilized world. Many refugees left the city and some found shelter on Hidalgo Ranch, owned by the Tejada family, one of whom, Raul Tejada, will become the courier's companion in the future. When the family realized they could no longer take in refugees, they had to fend off new settlers with weapons. One night, an enraged mob burned down the Tejada family's home killing everyone except Raul and his sister Rafaela and destroying the settlement. Raul and Rafaela lived on the ruins of Mexico City for several months until raiders killed Rafaela, prompting Raul to wander the wasteland. Over the following long and hungry years, the Peacock family at Bates Motel descended into cannibalism, hunting down unsuspecting travelers. As a result of the generational carousel of incest, the family transformed into hideous mutants. Over time, the ghouls in Mexicali deteriorated and became feral. It is known that when they couldn't find food, they would eat each other. Ultimately, just like Tanope in Nevada, the ghoul settlement died out after some time. The Tin Smiths tribe appeared in Tucson, consisting of descendants of military personnel who survived the Great War in hangars. This tribe had its religious cult with augmentation and cybernetics considered the highest of values. The Tin Smiths deified technology and believed that merging with it was the purpose of life. They renounced everything worldly. Family, emotions, happiness. None of it mattered. Davis Mountain Air Force Base, which was used as a site for decommissioned weapons and airplanes before the war, enticed the Tin Smiths with its treasures but also rendered inapproachable, as the Zach supercomputer at the heart of the complex guarded the territory with robots. The Tin Smiths referred to the base as the Forbidden Zone and regularly sent captured slaves there to try their luck and bring back something valuable, although very few succeeded. No doubt it would have been a great mistake to miss such an opportunity to incorporate into Fallout lore such a military landmark. In the 80s, the ventilation system of Sierra Madre finally failed, releasing all the stored toxin into the atmosphere, covering the area with a poisonous reddish haze. Those who managed to put on hazmat suits became trapped inside. They mutated internally, their consciousness deteriorating but becoming virtually immortal. As a result, the entire society within the complex devolved into a tribe of foolish, aggressive mutants who would become the sole inhabitants of this cursed place for centuries to come. The rare wanderers who visited Sierra Madre and survived to tell the tale would call them ghost people. The history of Vault 27 is provided in quite detail. On February 7, 2078, the first murder of a Mexican occurred in the vault. On December 11th of 2082, the water and electricity supply in the vault was reduced. The educational and entertainment sections were closed. Rationing began, leading to frequent conflicts and fights, which caused the medical section to become overcrowded. On January 2, 2083, an American was murdered in Vault 27, leading to the lynching of the Mexican by the residents. One of the inhabitants, Zachary Taylor, a veteran of the Battle of Anchorage, starts a riot and gathers followers in an attempt to evict the Mexicans. On March 13, 2084, a civil war breaks out in Vault 27. A group of rebels seizes the water purification facility. Taylor's supporters storm it and massacre the rebels. The defeated rebels are lynched by the victors. 
On December 16th of the same year, the overseer further reduces the water and food supply in Vault 27. Taylor believes he can manage the vault better and kills the overseer in his sleep, seizing power by force. On August 24, 2091, for the past seven years, Vault 27 has been under Taylor's dictatorship. Thanks to his iron-fisted rule, order and discipline are maintained in the vault. However, not everyone is content with the prospect of spending their lives underground. Among the survivors, suggestions to venture to the surface begin to circulate. On January 18, 2092, due to sabotage, the gear doors are opened in Vault 27, and the reconnaissance group heads into the wasteland, bringing back news of destroyed cities and contaminated radiation-ridden territory. However, on March 22nd, a group led by Felix Tejada, carrying a gag, fights their way to the vault's exit and disappears into the night of the wasteland. Left without gag, the vault dwellers are doomed, so some of them evacuate and settle in the outskirts of Phoenix. Afterward, Taylor seals the gear door, walling himself in with the remaining small group, destined to spend their days in the cold concrete corridors with dwindling supplies of water and food. Vault 25 was supposed to open this year, according to the plan, but the opening never happened. San Bramina, a settlement and gathering place for the Yavapai tribe, was formed through the recent unification of four independent tribes. The Indians revered and considered Brahmins sacred, but like Indians from India, engaged in cattle herding. San Bramina was important for the region as it was the main supplier of meat to nearby towns. In 2093, Felix Tejad and his group, heading west, founded the village of Vila, near the small prevar town of Oatman, on the border of the Mojave wasteland. Using the Gek, they established maize plantations and hid all the available technology in a cave and cellars, forbidding their use for generations to come, as technology is considered a danger to be feared like fire. Based on one of the groups that left Vault 25, the Black Villagers tribe is formed, settling in the city of Yuma, Arizona. In the Fallout New California lore, Vault 15 is mentioned because it doesn't account for the lore of Fallout Sonora. Here we can adapt the lore slightly. Survivors of Vault 27 were in complete despair. In 2094, Taylor initiated the self-destruction procedure of the vault, including the dispersal of a toxin. The people managed to partially block the ventilation, but it didn't help them. Some people died, while others transformed into deranged mutant ghosts capable of entering decades-long hibernation. This is very similar to the effect of the red mist in Sierra Madre. Perhaps Vault 27 also conducted experiments with the red gas. Who knows? But it could have been a cool connection to the can. It is unlikely that the city of Flagstaff survived the bombings, as it is known that there was a tribe in the area that only existed for three generations. So they appeared around 2100, to give or take a few years. By 2137, the Arizona Rangers slash Desert Rangers appeared and established a base at Parker Dam on the Colorado River. They had similar goals and policies to Wind of War, which involved protecting the locals in exchange for crops and recruits. However, their implementation was clearly better than the winds. Although many didn't support them, considering them useless like the wind, and believed they only drained settlements, some wastelanders still believed in them and sought refuge under their wing. In 2142, a group of jackals, exiled by the Huns from California, settled in the northern region, making their homes in dugout burrows and tunnels called jackal's holes. In Plot Sonora, their image changed somewhat. They were already savages, but they managed to become even more feral. They considered themselves as a pack, organized hunts for humans to devour and perform bloody sacrifices. Nevertheless, both in Sonora and other lore sources, it is indicated that the jackals is more a conglomeration of tribes. They seem to constantly split into separate independent packs, roaming the wastelands. In 2152, a group of nomads crossed the Sonoran desert. At some point, they attracted the hungry eyes of the Deathclaw, known as El Diablo, who began to pursue them, periodically snatching away their livestock and careless shepherds. The nomads couldn't fight it, but El Diablo protected their herd of people from raiders and other threatening creatures. Eventually, at the suggestion of the Elder, the nomads began to philosophically view this relationship, believing that El Diablo was protecting them and making them treat each other kindly in exchange for food. They considered it a divine manifestation. In the end, they fed El Diablo their entire livestock, old and sick members, and settled in the city of Santa Ana, founding a new settlement. Since then, they lived harmoniously and caring towards each other. However, to maintain their power and traditions, Elder lobbied for the idea of raising a portion of children exclusively for the annual sacrifice to El Diablo, accompanied by a citywide festival. By 2160, Cult of Fire emerged in Phoenix, created by descendants of Prevar scientists. They believed that the war was a purification for humanity. In 2160, shortly before the events of Fallout 1, the Brotherhood of Steel establishes an outpost that essentially becomes the base of its Arizona chapter in Puerto Penasco, a small Mexican port town on the shore of Wagner Bay. 
To be more precise, they set up the base on the Pound Destroyer, which they sailed from California. The leadership of the chapter was under High Paladin General Dixon, who I assume was required to wear aviators and a peaked cap with his epaulets. Under his leadership, the cell of the Brotherhood became something of an electroweaver. Despite the devastating war against the Master's army, by 2167 they had achieved incredible power in the region. But in 2160 they immediately went as a delegation to Phoenix, forming an alliance along the way with the tinsmiths of Tucson, who saw them as gods and gladly became their vassals. In the ruins of Kingman, the city of Garage City was founded, which heavily relied on the salvaging operations. Its leader was Carl Kogan. All the salvage obtained from the ruins of the city fought buyers among the caravans, which fueled the economy and made the city attractive to those seeking employment. In 2161, the Brotherhood of Steel subjugates the Cult of Fire, organizing the ascent of their man, Aaron, to a leadership position. The Brotherhood realized that to achieve their goals, they needed to build infrastructure and address the shortage of labor. Compared to California, the Sonora region lagged far behind in social and technological development. Life was boiling, kinda, but only in Phoenix. The Brotherhood understood that enforcing technological progress on the region by brandishing a plasma rifle was akin to American colonizer approaching Native Americans with a brochure advertising a new resort called Reservation. At the same time, directly seizing the region by force would lead to a war that would consume resources rather than generate them in a few years. They needed a more cunning solution. The Master's example provided them with an answer – the use of a puppet religious faction. This is where the Cult of Fire came into play. With the anointed Aaron, the cult changed its policy, focusing on the rebirth of civilization through its followers and the eradication of heretics, meaning people who didn't recognize the religion. The Tin Smiths also formed an alliance with the cult, although they didn't yet know that the cult was already subservient to the Brotherhood faction. In the same year, 2161, the Brotherhood founded the town of Casa Nueva, which was supposed to provide them with food from a farm. Casa Nueva was a city with a stern character. No alcohol, entertainment or weapons were allowed, and the curfew was enforced. Basically, it was a civil colony. The Brotherhood also brought a small expedition of the followers of the Apocalypse. The followers established a school and a medical center in Casa Nueva and restored a local research complex, Greenway Hydroponics, where they were conducting some botanical experiments. In 2161, caravans began passing through the abandoned prior city of Casa Grande, eventually organizing a camp there between Phoenix and Tucson. Soon the place gradually became settled. The residents asked the tinsmiths to restore an old water pump in exchange for children, which tinsmiths demanded to raise new accolades. At the behest of the Brotherhood, the cult began its expansion in the region and engaged in active propaganda activities. The cult financed a colonial expedition to the city of Flagstaff, a city of interest to the Brotherhood due to its uranium mine. Led by Roy Faber, the colonizers founded the city of Blackpool, displacing the tribe that lived there whose remnants periodically muttered something behind fences and poked sticks at the farmers on the outskirts of the city. Both mining the mine and developing other infrastructure required a large number of slaves. The Lost Hills Bunker, the headquarters of the Brotherhood, categorically disapproved of such methods in Dixon's mission. But with the impending war against the Master, Lost Hills had more pressing matters to attend to. Moreover, Dixon was too far away for him to be concerned about the leadership's opinion. He made decisions here and now, because in the end Los Hills also received a portion of uranium from Flagpole, so why complain? Another group consisting of supermutants and remnants of the cathedral after its destruction in the graveyard arrived in Mexicali, where they settled. However, due to radiation in the city and the proximity to the West Deck base emitting FAV, the people mutated into ghouls and other mutants. The group's leader, Levi, continues the master's experiments, attempting to invent an antidote that stabilizes the mutation process resulting in fewer side effects and physical suffering. The group eventually transforms into his religious flock, Cult of Levi. The local feral ghouls recognized them as their alpha, and the cult started using them as guard animals. The settlement of the cult was named Inferno. In Casa Grande, armed conflicts had been occurring for several years around the water pump, caused by overpopulation and unemployment. The fire cult didn't want to relinquish an important point in the region to the masses. The significance of the water pump could not be underestimated, and losing it in the heat of resolving disputes would be easy. They initiated a civil war, resulting in the removal of the city's mayor and the appointment of Count Alfred Bustos, who forcefully suppressed the opponents in the city, making the massive cemetery a major attraction after the water pump. A sizable gang called the Blue Shields emerged in the region, establishing their own base at the Prevor gas station. The gang consisted mainly of refugees from Casa Grande, who had been expelled from the city during Count Bustos' cope. The distinctive symbols of the Blue Shields were blue shields made from old road signs, 
and they used fuel as their primary weapon, which included flamethrowers and Molotov cocktails. While the Brotherhood in California desperately fought for survival throughout the region without any clear advantage, the Arizona chapter played politics. They unearthed Vault 25 in Phoenix, opened it and took control of it. The fate of the Vault Dwellers was not inviolable. By 2167, only one technician remained alive. The vault was handed over to the fire cult as an operational base, and the cathedral, based on the design of the cathedral of the children of the cathedral, was built above it. Additionally, with the Brotherhood's influence, the cult introduced the use of bottle caps as currency in Phoenix, and essentially throughout the whole region, borrowing the experience of the hub. Interesting events unfold in the south, in Mexico. This is no longer the wasteland of Sonora, but it's important to tell this story for the context. According to the official lore, we know practically nothing about Mexico except that Mexico City survived. Only Flots Nora provides some comprehensive understanding of what the neighbors of the great and mighty live by. And they turned out to be much more organized than united. By 2162, there were at least five separate states within Mexico. These were the former states of Guerrero, Tabasco, Chiapas and Yucatan, as well as the New Mexican Republic, united around the idea of hatred for Americans due to the pre-war annexation of Mexico in 2051. According to the dialogue, the NMR occupies the central states from Durango to Veracruz, and its headquarters are in Monterrey. In addition to this, the city of Los Machos exists deep in the country. The state itself is a military dictatorship that constantly expands and conquers territories, looking down with disdain at the civilians within their borders. While the four southernmost states are at war with each other and most fiercely around the Tehuantepec Isthmus, the NMR is pushing north toward the Mexican border and has already opened fronts in El Paso and Hermosillo. It is known that intense battles take place in El Paso, which halted further advancement of NMR. In Hermosillo, located on the border of the Sonora wasteland, the NMR had to suspend further progress as the army lacked the ability to cross the Sonora desert and establish a foothold on the other side. The leadership decided to establish quarters to hold their positions. Thus, Hermosillo became a border city. After Aaron came to power, the fire cult began forcefully subjugating the population of Phoenix in 2163. The Holy Inquisition carried out purges of dissidents and opposition members. Heretics were ritually burned at the stake and crucified. The city was experiencing a famine at the time, so not many opposed to getting rid of extra mouths. On August 16, 2163, a group of ghouls migrating east after the fall of Necropolis formed the Atomists faction and settled in Phoenix at the old Poseidon power plant. On August 17th, a treaty was signed between the fire cult and the atomists, who restored the functionality of the power plant and were able to provide the city with energy. Ideally, this date should have been pushed back a bit, but well, it is what it is. In 2164, during the great supermutant migration provoked by the destruction of the Master, one of the groups left Mariposa on a mobile fortress and headed for Texas. One might assume that this group is Atis group, but their leader was referred to as Captain, while Atis was a Scottish general. I will grant myself freedom of stating that this group is the Ernest group, introduced in Fallout 1.5 and which will end up in New Mexico in 2170. It is highly doubtful that three large supermutant groups, all coming from Mariposa in almost a straight line and at the same time, would not intersect and merge into one. Two groups is enough. I believe that such a combination of two pieces of lore is quite organic. In 2166, Garage City faced significant problems. Kingman started to exhaust its potential for scavenging. There was a shortage of work, nothing to sell to the caravans, and people began to become overpourished, leading to marginalization or migration to other settlements. By 2167, a livestock camp called Wainona was established on the site of the pre-war settlement of the same name, which supplied flagpole with Brahmin meat. A small town named San Felipe was founded in Baja California by a group of people traveling on a small vessel. The Sonora Express Mail Service appeared in the region with branches in Flagpole and Phoenix. Over these years, the fire cult was indeed involved in the revival of civilization. Although it was not their initial goal, it became a side effect of the Brotherhood's intervention in the archaic way of life of the local population. Indeed, the cult collected samples of old technology, books and other sources of knowledge, educated the population, attempted to establish control over food centers for uninterrupted food supply to settlements, built infrastructure, conducted experiments in scientific research and carried out monetary reforms. The only unclear thing is why they created a nuclear bomb in Vault 25 at the request of Brotherhood of Steel, but it was definitely not for benevolent purposes. The Red Cardinals gang emerged in Phoenix Bandit District, referencing the city's football team. Nameless raiders established a base in Caborca and in the mountains of Gila County, as well as a small camp in Pima County. 
Another gang operating in the region is Los Panchos. Near the Parker Dam, settlers seeking protection from the rangers created the town of Aqueduct on the site of the previous city of Havasu Spring and set up farms. By 2167, the rangers were led by Commander Burton Mosp. The fire cult came to the ruins of previous city of Quartzite under the guise of colonies to establish a branch in western Sonora. The settlement is called Quartz. The town of Gilo Bend was mentioned, but by 2167 it had been abandoned. In Phoenix, a resistance guerrilla cell known as the Phoenix Liberation Party emerged, engaging in sabotage against the fire cult and attempting to destroy or at least weaken them. They were based in the Phoenix sewers and allied with the rangers. The presence of the New Mexican Republic did not go unnoticed. The Brotherhood have still discovered a potential enemy and established an outpost in the city of Nogales, on the border with the Sonora Desert, to control possible advances by the Mexican army. Firecult took a strong interest in San Brahmin. They wanted to subjugate the tribe to control meat production and supply. They set up a missionary camp just by the settlement's entrance and tried different approaches to get under the tribe's skin. The year 2167 is the year of the major events in Sonora Wasteland, culminating in the war between the Brotherhood of Steel and the Arizona Rangers. It had been five years since the Master's fall. However, it had little impact on the wasteland itself. The migrating supermutants did not particularly terrorize the local population, and the Brotherhood Knights acquired interesting war stories, which they shared in the galley of the ship. The protagonist of the game is a young peasant of Vila, the descendant of Felix Tejada. Considering that in the 2270s Caesar's Legion will push the rangers out of Sonora into the Mojave, it would be more canonical for the peasant to cooperate with rangers and destroy the Brotherhood of Steel. Moreover, if the Brotherhood of Steel had won the war against the rangers, it would have sparked a discussion about their presence in the future and a possible war with the Caesar's Legion, which will turn this narrative into a mess. The events begin with mercenaries from Flagpole attacking Villa and taking the able-bodied population to the east for enslavement. Those who resisted were executed. Meanwhile, the peasant was wandering somewhere in the wasteland and returned just after the attack. Following the clues, he sets out to pursue the convoy, visiting various settlements along the way. Following the mercenary's trail, the peasant arrives at the nearest town, Garage City, where he receives a lead on Flagpole. However, he stays in the city for a while and helps mediate negotiations between Lucas, the leader of the scavengers, and Carl Cogan. The city was dying and Lucas seized the Watts Electronics Factory, which had not yet been dismantled. He planned to repair it so that it could generate power and help the city survive its existential crisis. The question was delicate because if Carl agreed, it would disrupt the anti-monopoly balance among the scavenger clans and he would lose his authoritarian rule. Meanwhile, the Firecult sends an expedition to Val 27 for archaeological excavations. However, the expedition faces a series of failures. First, the slaves escape, then ghost mutants attack the group and kill several members. Some of them go missing in the tunnels and eventually the expedition is abandoned and the members leave. Jackals attack a group of rangers and wipe them out. With the help of the peasant, the rangers infiltrate jackals' holes and they wipe out the tribe of savages, freeing their comrades from captivity. Other peasant heads towards Flagpool and a named tribe attacks Winona camp and slaughters all its workers. In Flagpool, thanks to his expert diplomacy skill, the peasant saves some of his fellow tribesmen from Roy Faber's control. At the bartender's request, the peasant also destroys a tribe which took over Wynonna. Next, the peasant establishes contact with the rangers from Parker Dam and presenting himself in San Bramin, helps the Native Americans resist the armed missionaries from Phoenix who stop camp near the gate. These missionaries attempted to entice the younger generation of the tribe with goods and ideas of complete consolidation for a better future. But in the end, the tribe, along with the rangers and the peasant, launches an attack and banishes the unwanted guests from their territory. The fire cult in Quartz uncovers some radioactive stuff at the Petro Chico gas station and get fairly goodified. In Phoenix itself, the peasant's arrival does not bode well for some factions. Firstly, the peasant becomes involved in a sabotage struggle between the Red Cardinals and the Atomists, resulting in the destruction of the gang. Furthermore, collaborating with the partisans, the peasant detonates a nuclear bomb in the cathedral, destroying the fire cult. The northern part of the city is destroyed and the cult's demise leads to social changes. The cap's system collapsed and they began to be eradicated like trash. People armed with pitchforks started to attack and lynch cult members they managed to capture. The Blue Shields attack Casa Grande and capture Busto's daughter. The peasant manages to save her and destroys the shields, blowing up their fuel tank. In Santa Ana, a coup takes place, the Elder is removed and El Diablo is killed. In Tucson, the peasant rescues his father and the remaining members of his village from the Forbidden Zone. He also disables some of the security protocols of the Zaks. 
What a skilled IT specialist was born in that remote village. Senior, no doubt. As for the tinsmiths, they weren't too upset about the downfall of the fire cult. In Casanueva, a small problem arises. Followers of the Pakalvis were experimenting with chemicals in their bio lab, and they accidentally synthesized a virus that turned people into plant like mutants from the Mojave. The infection began to spread towards the settlement through praying mantises, and some of the residents became infected. However, the city's leadership forces everyone to keep silent to avoid creating panic. The followers themselves are afraid to evacuate the city to prevent the raiders from coming and spreading the infection further into the wasteland. With the peasants' help, they manage to destroy the source of infection. A brotherhood squad with followers sets out from California to Puerto Penasco. They decide to go through Inferno, where they end up ambushed by ghouls. Almost entire group is wiped out, some hide and others are taken captive. The peasant helps in the liberation of the unfortunate travelers by offering assistance to Levi in inventing an antidote, although he himself becomes a ghoul. In Tucson, a gang of escaped slaves emerges, led by an undercover ranger, Jeff Kidder. He uses the slave gang to undermine the tinsmith's reputation by plundering caravans. The gang hides in the Old Town Bank building. The peasant convinces them to simply leave the city since the sun is preparing an attack and the slaves are too weak to withstand a siege. They leave and disappear into the wasteland. The Brotherhood seeks revenge on a group of unnamed highwaymen who robbed their caravan. They establish a field camp and organize attacks on the raiders at the Pima County camp, the base in Caborca and the base in the Gila Caves. Along the way, while completing various side quests, the peasant destroys a family of mutants at Bates Motel, the Lost Panchos gang, and breaks the mobile fortress of the super mutants, forcing them to continue to New Mexico on foot. The peasant had to decide which side of the conflict to take, which fate was close to him a villager in a loincloth or a system administrator at Google. As mentioned before in this story, the ranger's side was chosen. Gathering back people from the captivity, Villa wants to form an alliance with the rangers for their own safety. But to do so, their opponents had to be eliminated. The peasant sneaks onto a destroyer and activates the sequence for the delayed torpedo detonation. A blast occurs in the Brotherhood of Steel in Arizona sets off to feed the three-eyed fish. All this turmoil of course had consequences for the settlements. Will had to let go of its archaic dogmas and accept the inevitability of contact with other settlements for survival. Thanks to the functioning factory, Garage City ceased its decline. The rangers became the dominant force in the region, although they did not have imperial ambitions. Thus, three settlements plus Aqueduct and San Bramin formed an alliance with a regular caravan connection. Blackpool quickly declined and emptied, left without uranium consumers in the form of Phoenix, Pueblo and Lost Hills Bunker. Due to the decline in trade and other activities and the lack of support from sponsors, both Casa Grande and Casa Nueva also died out soon. In Tucson, Zax, no longer constrained, used the robots under its control to eliminate the tinsmiths. Now it's time to discuss the Fallout Sonora Dayglow expansion lore, which was finally released in September 2023 after two years of quite troublesome development. So, before 2167, a small group of super mutants appears in the city and settles in Balboa Park. Among them is Private Pyle, after whom we will conditionally name the group. I'm sure you know to whom Private Pyle is a reference to, and it's quite ingenious. A small brotherhood of steel squad takes the super mutant captain hostage, and after Private Pyle's failure, he is cast out and settles in San Isidro. Within the narrative of the Lost Holotapes, we won't introduce this pair of brotherhood soldiers because they lack of exposition, context for their presence in the location and leave behind a trail of questions. Their only role in this secondary quest is to die when the player tries to rescue the super mutant captain at Private Pile's request. The so-called Black Scavengers have established an outpost in Paradise Valley Hospital in National City and at the Consolidated Aircraft Factory. The Black Scavengers are not a single faction but a consolidation of various scavenger groups in the city who have received approval from the administration of the ghoul's settlement Old Town for excavation. However, for simplicity we will unify them into a single faction. The scavengers have absolutely no respect for the agreement with the ghouls or the ghouls themselves. Therefore, at the aircraft factory they don't get their hands dirty but force the enslaved ghouls to engage in debris clearing. The individuals from the hospital engage in looting ghouls traveling between settlements. In San Diego's Italian quarter, not far from Old Town, an enterprising ghoul establishes La Pension, a place where ghouls can relax, enjoy a cup of hot radium, take isotope baths, play roulette, dance in wigs and purple clothing, essentially reliving, if not in body, then in spirit, the nostalgic pre-war years. 
Five years have passed since the fall of Necropolis and the arrival of the ghouls. Technically, the main character from Sonora arrives in the region, and somehow that triggers everyone to suddenly become active. However, his presence is entirely unimportant and lacks context within the story, so we won't mention him. So, San Isidro, with the help of the super mutant Pile, clears Sweetwater Dam in Bonita from robots, allowing the settlement to start producing electricity for its needs. John Butler, the leader of Old Town, needs some super duper chips that can only be found at the aircraft factory. He wishes to use them in trade to acquire various useful items for the settlement. On the other hand, Gustavo, the leader of San Isidro, wants to use these chips to repair robots, which would help rebuild this city faster with their mechanized limbs. Essentially, this sets the stage for the storyline's divergence. A delegation from Old Town, a part of which was Private Pile, goes to the Scavengers, who get freaked out seeing a super mutant and open fire. Old Town has no choice but to launch an assault on the factory to eliminate the Scavengers. Surprisingly, and not as it is unknown whether they knew about the ghoul slaves, they find ghoul prisoners and free them. San Isidro in turn wipes out a group of scavengers in the hospital in response to their looting and torture of hostages. One group of scavengers starts lurking around La Pension and its lobster director sends a squad of his henchmen to deal with unwanted individuals in the area. A group of super mutants Private Pile was a part of attacks the Fargo trader's caravan, which is still active in the region after the fall of the hub. Old Town had to rescue the Fargo traders secretly and without bloodshed by discreetly removing them from the besieged warehouse. The super mutants frustrated leave to the east, possibly joining Attis. It is important to clarify that both the Fargo traders and the Black Scavengers are representatives of the hub, with which Old Town conducts business. The hub was destroyed and then rebuilt around 2170, only according to the lore of Fallout 1.5, which is not considered in Fallout Sonora lore. However, choosing between rewriting the lore of Fallout 1.5 and the convention that the Fargo traders are based not in the hub, but for example in the Boneyard or Junktown, I'll choose the latter. Ghouls on the coast are drooling looking at Coronado Island, because who knows what treasures the military base keeps in its bowels. San Isidro sends a squad to obtain weapons, protection and other goods. The ghouls and pile disable the alarm system, thereby neutralizing the robots patrolling the base. Upon returning to the coast, this squad is attacked by a group from Old Town, which claim the base contents. A shootout occurs which can be considered a turning point in the relationship between the two settlements. Now they no longer cooperate, but compete for living space. This concludes the story of the Sonora Wasteland, told to us in a very worthy fun game. However, it only ends at the moment of 2167. It will be picked up in the future by Van Buren, Fallout New California and Fallout New Vegas, so we will return here in future episodes. I'm sure it will be interesting to think about how the surviving settlements and factions will encounter Caesar's Legion in the future. Once again, I remind you, don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment, if you enjoy this narrative, of course. This will greatly help in developing this project. And that's all for today. Try not to press big red buttons on destroyers, and we will meet again in the Wasteland Wanderers. Fishers out!